Krishna Padaya, Krishna Pristaya Bhutale, Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Simhami, Namaste Sarasati Devi, Gauravani Pricharine, Nirvisha Shashanyavani Paschachati Shatari. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Satim Vyasam, Tato Jayamudhiraya, Tato Jayamudhiraya, Nasta Praeshu Vabadreshu, Nasta Praeshu Vabadreshu, Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya, Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya, Bhagavati Uttama Shloke, Bhagavati Uttama Shloke, Bhavati Naishtaki Bhavir Bhavati Naishtaki Krishna Swadhamo Bhagate Krishna Swadhamo Bhagate Dharma Jnana Diti Saha Dharma Jnana Diti Saha Kalo Nishtam Drisham Mesha Kalo Nishtam Drisham Mesha Puranato Drano Drata Puranato Drano Drata we're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter Number 3, entitled The Lord's Pastimes Out of Vrindavan. This morning, text number 7. Tatra Dritas Tata Naradeva Naradeva Kanya Kanya Kajena Jitva, Harim, Arta Bandam, Utaya, Sadyo, Jagrihu, Raharsha, Vridanuraga, Prahita Vak. Prahita Valokai Tatra Ritasta Naradeva Kanya Kujena Jisva Harim Arta Bundum Utaya Sadyo Jekrihu Praharsha Utaya Sadyo Jekrihu Praharsha Vrita Nuraga Prahita Valokai Vrita Nuraga Prahita Valokai Tatra Rita Stav Naradeva Kanya Tatarita Naradeva Kanya Kajena Jisva Harim Arta Bandum Udaya Sadyo Jagrihu Praharsha Udaya Sadyo Jagrihu Praharsha Vritanu Raga Praharsha Tava loka, Tava loka, Tava loka, Tava loka, 
सज्यो जगरे हो प्रहार्षा सज्यो जगरे हो प्रहार्षा प्रजानुरागा प्रहिता बलोका Inside the house of Narakasura, Akrita kidnapped. All these, all those, Naradeva Kanya, daughters of many kings, Kujena by the demon. Jiswa by seeing. Harim the Lord. Artha Bandam the friend of the distressed. Uthaya had once got up. Sadhya then and there. Jagriho accepted. Praharsha joyfully. Vrita shyness. Anuraga attachment. Prahita avalokai by eager glances. Translation. There, in the house of the demon, all the princesses kidnapped by Narakasur at once became alert upon seeing the Lord, the friend of the distress. They looked upon him with eagerness, joy, and shyness, and offered to be his wives. Please repeat. There, in the house of the demon. There, in the house of the demon. All the princesses, all the princesses kidnapped by Narakasura, kidnapped by Narakasura, at once became alert, at once became alert upon seeing the Lord, upon seeing the Lord, the friend of the distressed, the friend of the distressed. They looked upon him, they looked 
upon him with eagerness, with eagerness joy and shyness, joy and, shyness and, offered to be his wife. and offered to be his wife. Purport by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Narakasur kidnapped many daughters of great kings and kept them imprisoned in his palace. But when he was killed by the Lord and the Lord entered the house of the demon, all the princesses were enlivened with joy and offered to become his wives because the Lord is the only friend of the distressed. Unless the Lord accepted them, there would be no chance of their being married because the demon kidnapped them from their father's custody and therefore no one would agree to marry them. According to Vedic society, girls are transferred from the custody of the father to the custody of the husband. Since these princesses had already been taken away from the custody of their father, it would have been difficult for them to have any husband other than the Lord himself. Om Jnana Timuram Dasya Jnana Jnana Shalakaya Chakshurun Milimamina Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Sahitam Yena Bhutale Sayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Svapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yadapada Kamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Chakrajatam Sahagana Ragana Tanvitam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Pada Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakamitam Scha He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishamanustate Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpata Rubyasya Kripa Sindhu Vayevacha Patitana Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Hatvaita Kadadhar Shri Vasadi Kaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So in this section of Srimad Bhagavatam Vidura is inquiring from Uddhava. First of all, anyway, Uddha, Vidura went to Uddhava. He wanted to know about, he wanted to hear about Lord Krishna and his pastimes. So Uddhava is describing to him the Lord's pastimes out of Vrindavan, first of all. And he described about the killing of Kamsa, and how Lord Krishna then went to Gurukula and how he satisfied Sandipani Muni and then what were some of the other incidents mentioned in this chapter? Those of you who are coming regularly, you remember what was happening? Nobody remembers. Huh? You don't remember the beginning of the chapter. Anyway, we 
he came to describe about the killing of Narakasura. Or sometimes that demon is also known as Bomasura. Both names, the same person. So he was the son of Bumi, the earth planet. And it is said that the father was the Lord himself. And so it's certainly surprising that the Lord would come and kill his own son. But this is the situation. If the son is a rascal, a demon, then he deserves to be killed. And as we heard in the previous verse, Uddhava was describing how Bhomashura wanted to take the whole sky. In other words, he wanted to take everything. He was, you know, conquering everything. And he wanted to enjoy all of the opulence. He had taken even some residence in the higher planets, in the kingdom of the demigods. And he was enjoying there. And all the young, beautiful princesses were also thought to be for his enjoyment. And he was so powerful that no one could stop him. And it was Indra himself, the king of heaven, who had to approach Lord Krishna and ask Lord Krishna to do something about this demon. And so we can just imagine how powerful he was. He had taken the earrings from Mother Atiti, the mother of the demigods, he was such a powerful demon. Indra was able to fight Vritasura, but he, he had to go to Lord Krishna and ask Lord Krishna to do something about this Bomasura. So, of course, Lord Krishna came and with the help of his Sudarshan Chakra, Lord Krishna was able to defeat Bomasura. There's a wonderful description in the Krishna book. It's in the 59th chapter. This is the 59th chapter of the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, which means it's also in the 59th chapter of the Krishna book. And there you hear about Lord Krishna after he was informed by Indra. Then he came on the back of Garuda along with Satyabhama. He brought his wife with him and describes how Bomasura had a very almost invincible kingdom. It was a, a big powerful fort with uh, strongholds in each of the four directions. And then there was a moat, and, you know, a canal of water surrounding his whole city. And then he had barbed wire fences which were electrified. The whole thing was prepared by a demon named Mura. Even compared to today's modern technology, it was a very powerful, almost invincible kingdom. And he had also a gaseous substance which we would release, which would stop people from entering into his kingdom. So it was real modern warfare. It was almost like what we read about in the newspapers about the terrorist attacks you know all the thing all the things they do and so lord krishna came there and with the help of his first of all he used his club to defeat the different armies of bomashura and then he released Sudarshan chakra to tear to pieces all the barbed wire and electrification and get rid of all the gaseous substances. And then Lord Krishna came and he had to fight the demon Mura. And demons also have their friends. Just like we have association with devotees, demons also have their association. You know, Harani Kashi put Prahlad Maharaj into the school for the demons. You know, go and associate with other demons. Of course, Prahlad was preaching to the demons and all the sons of the demons. And he was trying to make them devotees. But, you know, the, the idea, their association. Birds of a feather flock together. Right? 
And we, so we see the demons, they like to associate with other demons. Banasura had his demon friends. In the same way, Bomasura also had his demon friends. And they all came to help him fight against Lord Krishna. But Lord Krishna defeated all of them. And he defeated also Bomasura. And with the death of Bomasura, then Lord Krishna entered into this palace of the demon. It's mentioned here. He entered into the house or the palace of this great powerful demon. And within the palace, within the prisons, there were all of these uh, princesses, as they're described. Uh, Kanya, right? Kanya means the, the daughter. Uh, Gopi Kanya. Prabhupada talks about Visha Kanya, poison girls. Sometimes, they, sometimes the kings would bring up young women by giving them poison every day. The idea is that the young girl would be given a little poison every day and because from her birth she's given a little poison every day, she's not affected by it. She's, she's used to it. It doesn't bother her. And she grows up to be a beautiful young woman and when she's very beautiful and in, in her prime, then the king will do, present this young woman as a, as a present to his enemy. He will give the beautiful young woman to his enemy. And the, then the, the enemy thinks, oh, he's giving me such a nice young woman to enjoy. And when he goes to enjoy the young woman, then just from one kiss of this young woman, the king will die because this young woman has been given the poison every day. This Visha Kanya, she's a poison girl, you see. And so the king goes to taste the lips of the young woman and she breathes her poison into the king and the king dies. So this was one of the ways in which kings would deal with other kings with their enemies. So anyway, these girls were not poison girls, these 16,000 girls, they were all the daughters of wonderful kings, but these kings had been defeated by Bomasura. Bomasura had defeated them and he'd taken their daughters as well as all of their wealth, he captured all of their wealth and all of their kingdom, it said, when Lord Krishna entered the demon, the, the home of this demon, Bomashura, he, he took, there were 50,000 white elephants, each with four tusks. We cannot begin to imagine what was the opulence. Of, you know, this, this was just one demon king. He had so many thousand white elephants. You know, just to have an elephant today, it's a big thing. But white elephant, and then a white elephant with four tusks, and he had thousands of them. So it gives, you, gives us some idea of the opulence. And in order to have this opulence, he had to have been very powerful. Of course, as we said, he was the son of the Lord himself. When Lord Varaha picked up the earth planet from the bottom of the Garbhodak ocean, at that time, you all know that story from Srimad Bhagavatam, how the earth planet had fallen into the bottom of the universe. So, Lord Varaha, the Lord took the form of the boar, coming from the, no the nostril of Brahma, he assumed his Varaha incarnation, and he dove into the bottom of the universe and he picked up the earth planet on his task and put it back in position. So Mother Bhumi is the personification of the earth planet. And when the Lord picked up Mother Bhumi, at that time she requested the Lord to please give her a child. Hmm. 
We may go on the, oh, why would she be attracted to the boar? Boars, they're not nice things, are they? And there was some discussion when the devotees were, first of all, painting pictures for that section of Srimad Bhagavatam. So the artists, the Ashrila Prabhupada, about the boar, how to pre present the boar. Because usually when, when we think of a boar, you think, ooh, you know, <laughs> this disgusting, you know, you, you see the pigs in Vrindavan, ooh, <laughs> you want to keep away, dirty. But Prabhupada explained that Krishna, in all of his different incarnations, is always attractive. So even when he comes as a boar, Although generally you wouldn't think of a boar as being very attractive, actually Krishna was, a, when he came in his Varaha incarnation, he was attractive. And we, it's, this, it's described that in the past, particularly in South India, there were many kings in South India who worshipped Lord Varaha. And some of them even had currency. The currency was called Varahas. Not rupees, not dollars, Varahas. Mm. So Lord Varaha was very popular. The worship, just like we're pop, we're, we have a lot of uh, attraction to Lord Nishringadev. You know, people like Lord Nishringadev today. You don't see many people promoting Lord Varaha. We see a lot of people with Nishringadev and the Shringa Kavachas. I don't see anybody with Lord Varaha, you know. But in the past, Lord Varaha was very, very attractive. And many, many people worship Lord Varaha. And in South India today, you can see there are many deities still of Lord Varaha. Varaha. And even if you go in Navadvip Dham, in, uh, in Navadvip town itself, there is, uh, Navadvip is called Kola Dvip. And Kola means the boar, because Lord Varaha appeared there in the Satya Yuga. He appeared to the Brahmana, one Brahmana who was a devotee of Lord Varaha. He worshipped the Lord and he desired to see Lord Varaha. And Lord Varaha appeared to him there in the Satya Yuga. And in commemoration of this, you can see there's one, uh, there's at least one temple there which we know as the Gaudiya Math temple and they have the deity of Lord Varaha Dev there. So uh, Lord Varaha picked up the earth planet and at that time Mother Bhumi desired a child and the Lord fulfilled her, his, her desire. And the result was her child was born, Boma. But by bad association he, he became a demon. Although he was a child of the Lord he became a demon by bad association. We reflect the qualities of the people we associate with. It is said uh, Boma Sura had as been associating with Bana Sura. And Bana Sura is a great devotee of Lord Shiva. And he was very, oh, very demoniac. And Prabhupada said, demon, atheist means demon. Simple way of understanding what is it? Somebody who is an atheist, who does not accept the supremacy of the Supreme Lord, then that is demoniac. They're not obedient to the Lord. They won't follow the directions of the Lord. This is demon. So Bhomasura became a demon. And with this demonic association, he desired more and more power, more and more opulence. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes there are two natures, right? Which chapter in the Bhagavad Gita describes the two natures? Come on. You must know this. Right? You're all reading Bhagavad Gita chapter a day, right? One chapter a day, isn't it, Prabhu? Chapter a day, chapter 16, Divine and Demoniac Nature, Daivi Sampad and Asurik Sampad. Two natures. If you're not a devotee, you're a demon. 
there's nothing in between. Some, somebody was arguing with me, he said, no, no, I think there should be something in between. <laughs> but no, Krishna makes it very clear, very cut and dry. Either you're a devotee or you're the demon. No? Of course, we have a mixture of both qualities within us. In the Kali Yuga, the devotee and the demon are in the same body, right? We're always fighting with the, the lower nature. And we talk about the lower nature and the higher nature. The higher nature is to be the devotee, the lower nature is to be the demon. So what is the demonic mentality in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes? Ishwaraham maham bogi siddhoham balabham sukhi. The, de the demon is thinking, I am the controller. This is atheist. They don't accept the supremacy of God. Ishwaraham aham bogi. Not only am I the, the controller, I am the enjoyer. Everything is meant for me. Just like this demon, Bomasur. He, every beautiful woman, every daughter of every king, it's for his enjoyment. He wants them. And he, he had a, taken 16,000 of these young girls to keep in his palace. Oh. This is demon. You know, he, he's thinking, everything is for my enjoyment. Uh, one uh, professor came to visit Srila Prabhupada. When Srila Prabhupada was in Philadelphia, I think it was, one professor came because that time Rabindra Swarup Prabhu was doing his PhD. He completed it long ago now. But at that time, in Prabhupada's time, he was doing his PhD in a prestigious, I think it was Temple University, Philadelphia. He was doing his PhD in Asian philosophy and one of the professors came to meet Srila Prabhupada and so when he came to meet Prabhupada this man who this professor who was actually Indian bodied he came and said to Srila Prabhupada the first thing he said to him as he came in the door he said to he said, how can you worship a god who is an adulterer he was accusing Krishna of being an adulterer and Prabhupada simply looked at him and said, It is you who are the adulterer. All women belong to God. So Prabhupada was very clear and he just cut that man right to pieces, you know. Then man was thinking, Krishna was simply enjoying so many other women. But actually, Krishna is the Supreme Lord. The professor had no understanding of Krishna's position as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Abhajananti mamudha manushintana mashritam param bhava majananto mamabhuta maheshwaram The foolish mock at me descending amongst them like a human being. They do not know my transcendental nature and supreme dominion over all that be. So even this professor in philosophy and religion could not understand Krishna's actual position. And therefore he became a, an offender to the Lord and he was accusing Krishna as being an adulterer. Just like we know in Singapore, if a man has is it a crime to have more than one wife? Is it considered adultery? Yeah, probably, yeah. If you're, maybe if you're Muslim, it's allowed. But uh, generally, well, of Hindu people often also have some, more than one wife. But uh, generally, the rule is one wife, right? And you, if you keep more than one wife, then this is considered being an adulterer. So this man thought Krishna is an adulterer. He's got taken all these wives. But Prabhupada said, no, all women belong to God. This is the, this is actual fact. That we're all Krishna's energy, not only women, the men also belong to God, right? We're all feminine in relation to Krishna. Only Krishna is male. We are all feminine. We are all prakriti. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes his energies in chapter 7. 
he describes first of all his separated material energies. Bumerapo nalo vayu kamano buddha evacha ahankara iti yame bina prakriter ashtada. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego. All together, these eight comprise my separated material energy. So this is Krishna's inferior energy, his separated material energy. But then Lord Krishna goes on to say, Apariyamitastvanyam prakritim vidime param jiva bhuta mahabaho yeidam dirdyache. Besides this, there is another energy of mine, right? Prakriti. Prakriti jiva me param. We're, we are prakriti. We're not purushas. Hindi language is wrong. In Hindi, male is purush. We're thinking we are purusha. But there's only one purush. Actually, Krishna is the real purush. We are all prakriti. According to Bhagavad Gita, we are the Prakriti. We are para -prakriti. We are superior. The material energy is the inferior Prakriti. Because in that material energy, earth, water, fire, air, ether, that does not have consciousness. We are considered the superior Prakriti because we have consciousness. So, some distinction there, two kinds of prakriti, para and apara, superior and inferior. We are superior on account of our consciousness. But the problem is that our consciousness has become polluted. And instead of recognizing our position as being the servant of the Lord, we are thinking we are the enjoyer. We are thinking, Ishwaraham, aham bogi, Sidoham Balavam Suki. I am the controller, I am the enjoyer, I, I am perfect, I have all powers, I am strong, Bala and Suki, I am happy. So Bomasura was thinking like this. He had this wonderful kingdom, great defense system, his big army to protect him, and his wire his barbed wire fencing and gases and electric electricity and every so many ways trying to protect himself but krishna came there and krishna defeated him krishna killed him and krishna took back what is actually meant for the pleasure for the service of the lord and so krishna came into the palace and saw all of these young ladies. And these young ladies, they saw Lord Krishna, and it is described how they saw them, how they saw Krishna. That they're mentioned, their qualities are mentioned, that how they were attracted to Krishna. Naturally, they would be attracted to Krishna because he's all attractive. He said, uh, they looked upon him with eagerness, joy, and shyness. Be a feminine quality, shyness, sadly lacking in the modern society. Some young women sometimes today, particularly in the Western culture, are not taught shyness. Hmm? Rather, they promote that, you know, women are equal to men, and so women are very bold and <laughs> they would do everything a man does and they don't have the quality of shyness anymore. But actually this is a, the important feminine quality. So these young ladies had been taken from their homes and put into the house of Bomasura. Just like we know in Ramayana, her mother Sita was kidnapped by Ravan. And so Lord Ramachandra had to go to Lanka and rescue her, kill Ravan, and release Mother Sita. And when Mother Sita was brought out of Lanka, then they had a, a, a great fire was built, and Mother Sita was requested to enter into that fire to prove her chastity. 
because a woman is not expected to go to the home of another man. And if a woman goes into a associates with some man other than her husband, then she loses her chastity. So Mother Sita's chastity had to be uh, proven. And for this purpose, a great fire was built and Mother Sita walked into that fire. Now in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, there's one interesting pastime describing how Lord, Rama, uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was traveling in South India and he met this one Brahmana who was a great devotee of Lord Ramachandra. But this man was lamenting how Mother Sita had been kidnapped by Ravan. And he thought it's so unfortunate that Mother Sita is the goddess of fortune and she has been taken by this demon Ravan. And, and the, 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 the Brahmana was regularly fasting. He didn't, he didn't even have appetite to eat because he was lamenting so much that Mother Sita had been taken by the hands of this demon, Rav. However, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu assured him that it couldn't be like this. He told the Brahmana that actually Mother Sita is the goddess of fortune and a demon like Ravan cannot even look on the form of Mother Sita, what to speak of even handle the, the form of Mother Sita. However, Lord Chaitanya at that time initially was not able to pacify the mind of the Brahmana. But then Lord Chaitanya, after he left the home of that Brahmana, then he went to Rameshwaram. And while he was in Rameshwaram, then he heard the brahmanas reciting a scripture, one of the Puranas. And he heard within that Puranas, it was described how Mother Sita never, was never touched by Ravan. But it was a Maya Sita which was taken by Ravan. The actual divine form of Mother Sita was uh, taken by Agni, the fire god. And the divine form, uh, the, the Amaya Sita was taken by Ravan. So the Maya Sita was residing in Lanka. And when Lord Ramachandra killed Ravan and released Sita, then that Maya Sita entered into the fire. And at that time, then Agni, the fire god, brought out the divine form of Mother Sita. So this was all described within the scriptures. And when Lord Chaitanya heard this, then he was very happy and he had, he had his section of the scriptures copied and he immediately came back to the home of that Brahmana and he read the scriptures to this Brahmana and he told him how Mother Sita had not been touched by Rama. So in this way the Brahmana, he said, the Brahmana thanked Lord Chaitanya profusely. He said, you have saved my life. I was ready to commit suicide because I was lamenting so much that Mother Sita had been handled by Ravan. But could not be. Mother Sita keeps her chastity. So in the same way, uh, all women are encouraged to keep this quality of chastity. We know in the Ramayana that after the exile of Lord Rama, then he came back to Ayodhya, and Lord Ramachandra would regularly go out in his kingdom and he would disguise himself and he would listen to what people were saying. So one evening when he was going through his kingdom, he heard a barber arguing with his wife and he was telling his wife that he didn't want his wife to come back home to him. He, he said, you've been unchaste, you've gone with another man. And he said, Lord Rama may accept his wife back after she's been in the home of another man. But I, I don't want my wife after she's been with another man. So when Lord Ramachandra heard this, then he immediately came home and he dispatched Mother Sita to the ashram of Valmiki, although she was pregnant at that time. And in this way, Mother Sita went to the the far, went to the ashram of Valmiki, um, yeah? and she, she 
and after giving birth to the, her two sons, then she returned to the earth. She was born from the earth, then she returned to the earth. So the point was uh, very important for women to keep this quality of chastity. In the Vedic culture, Prabhupada uses the word here in this purport, he said, the woman is the custodian of her father. She's under the custody of her father. And when she's married, she's under the custody of her husband. Custody. Sounds like you're a prisoner, isn't it? You know? Just like, you know, if you get arrested by the police force or something, you're, you're, you're put in custody. <laughs> it's a, you've done some crime. So, Prabhupada uses that word here in the purport that women traditionally were not given independence, but they were given protection. Now, of course, this was very controversial when Prabhupada was in America and he was talking about these things, because in the 1970s there was a lot of women's liberation. There was a lot of talk about women's liberation. It was a very big thing. Women were really pushing it, you know, American women especially, you know. They can tend to be very aggressive and bold. We see Hillary Clinton just trying to become president of America and so on. You don't see that in China or in Russia. You don't see women politicians. Yeah. If you look at the all the leaders of state in China, every one male, not one woman. And similarly also Russia, practically every one male. But Western culture, women have been given this kind of position. Prabhupada said this idea of women's liberation, he said this was a trick of the men. The men tricked the, tricked the women. He said, yeah, you're equal. Now you also go out to work. <laughs> right? In China they have the saying too. In China they, say, they try to promote that they're equal. Although it's not. They say men, nan nu ping dang. Men, women, equal. And the, the meaning is, you also go to work, not only the men. <laughs> and in this way the labor force is doubled. And that means you get twice as much money coming home, men. If this man's working, then the, you, you, you're know, just depending on one person to bring money home. But both are working, then twice the income. <laughs> but although women uh, are, are told they're equal, Prabhupada also pointed out, it's the women who have to give birth to children. Men don't give birth to children. So, so this is a, a big, big difference between men and women. The women are going to carry the children, they're going to... Men, okay, they can take, help, help a little bit to take care of children. But ultimately, it's the woman who does the feeding. <laughs> it's the woman's breast which feeds the child, not the man's breast. And so, th there is a difference there. Women do need protection, and that was the Vedic culture, that women would be looked after, they would be protected. But modern times, women are more they tend more to be ex exploited. But sometimes women don't always appreciate that they're being exploited. And they demand equality. But with that equality, they're put into more, a more distressing situation. So sometimes people even criticize Lord Rama that Lord Ramachandra should never have done this, he should never have sent his wife away like this, this is terrible. There was a group of women in ISKCON even, 
in, in the West and they had a very big campaign on the internet about Lord Ramachandra that he did this terrible thing, he sent his wife away to the fort. There's such a terrible thing, how any husband could do this to his wife. His wife was pregnant and he sent her away. What kind of husband is this? What kind of example is this? <laughs> very difficult. You know? And you know, it, it was an ongoing, the discussion is still going on, you know, you can never really satisfy the minds of mm, some women. <laughs> they won't, they'll never agree that Lord Ramachandra did this to set an example that he wants to be the ideal ruler. As a ruler, he has a duty to set the perfect example. And it was very important for him as a ruler that people would respect him. And if there was any doubt in his character, then it's very bad. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu describes in the Chaitanya Charitamrita how he did not want to meet Maharaj Prataparudra. The Maharaj Prataparudra, he said, is a materialist. He said, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I am a sannyasi in the renounced order of life. I am not even supposed to see a materialist like a king. He said, it will be a stain on my character. He said, if there's one stain on the cloth, then the whole cloth is ruined. So similarly, Lord Ramachandra was applying this principle in his own government. He wanted to have the perfect government. But if there was doubt about the character of the king, then the, the government is no longer considered perfect. And so anyway, yeah, this is a, there's a lot could be said about this, you know, you could <laughs> discuss this for a long time about what's the proper position Nowadays, of course, there's a lot of discussion in, in, in ISKCON. Should women be gurus? You know, it's another thing. Which is being, theoretically, yes, women are also gurus. But we also know it's, it's a little diff different. You know, if a woman is sitting up here, and then our, it, it's a little different. It's a different mood. I remember one time I was in Hong Kong. And a, a lady came to the Hong Kong Hindu temple, a lady sannyasi. First of all, you know, usually ladies are not supposed to be sannyasis. It's not the Vedic culture, but there are some lady sannyasis. A woman in saffron dress with the long hair. So she came to Hong Kong and she was giving a lecture. So I was interested, I didn't go, but I wanted to, I, I heard some people who did go, and I, I was listening to what they were saying, and one man was saying, well, she has nice eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, from that I could just understand something a little bit about what is the mood, you know. <laughs> When the woman, the young, especially a woman who's not very old, you know, when she's sitting up here in front of a bunch of men, you know, what's going on in people's minds, you know? So the, the, this is the problem. This is one of the reasons why, you know, it, it's a little difficult to put women into that kind of position. And for most ladies, they don't want that kind of position. But, you know, there are cases of women being spiritual masters. There are examples. We know that the wife of Lord Nityananda, after Lord Nityananda departed, then his wife became not only spiritual master, but something of an acharya in the line of the Siddhic succession. And uh, similarly also Srinivas Thakur's daughter, Himalata Thakurani, she was a prominent Vaishnava spiritual master. So there are cases of women doing. So far in ISKCON we have uh, women giving shiksha, but we don't have any ladies who have as yet given diksha. I think the GBC body are still discussing these things.
Anyway, uh, we here, here we are seeing some example of the, the opulence of Lord Krishna, that he could have 16,000 wives. He could give them all shelter. And, of course, he could satisfy all of them. Srila Prabhupada in Srimad Bhagavatam discusses polygamy, the idea of having more than one wife. He says that actually, theoretically, it's, it's good. And, and in the past, it was more common for people to... But in the past, to have more than one wife meant you had to have enough wealth to maintain them. It's not just having a wife, but it's maintaining them, looking after them. And so, you know, if you're a very powerful king, you have a lot of money and so on, then you can have more than one wife. And Lord Krishna, as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, certainly he could enjoy unlimitedly. People may say, oh, he's very lusty. He's supremely lusty. But his lust is not like our lust. It was the desire of these ladies to become the wives of Lord Krishna. And if Lord Krishna had not accepted them, then they had no, no shelter. No one would be their husband. But Lord Krishna could accept all of them and give them all a palace. He took all of them to Dwarka and gave each and every one of them their own palace. And each and every one of them gave birth to ten children from Lord Krishna. This is the Supreme Lord. Lord Krishna, not only, he didn't just live with one and then go to another one, you know, like some king who has many wives. He lives with one wife for a day and then he goes to the other wife the next. But Krishna can live every day with each and every one of the wives because Krishna can expand himself unlimitedly to be with each and every one of his wives. So this is the Supreme Lord. This is the opulence of the Supreme Lord. Why 16,108 wives? He could have many more if he wanted. His, his potency is unlimited. But 16,108, that 16,000 were there from the palace of Bomasura. So they all became his wife. And then there were eight other principal wives who they're, they're how Lord Krishna acquired them. It's also described in the 10th canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. So Lord Krishna's pastimes are, he, he's portraying the activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When Lord Krishna comes in this world, he's showing us Lila Purushottam, the pastimes of the Supreme Person. Lord Ramachandra is Maryada avatar. It's different. Lord Ramachandra is showing us the behavior, perfect behavior of a king. But Lord Krishna is showing us the supreme personality of Godhead. How, how he enjoys. What are his activities? So these are some thoughts on this verse. Are there some questions and comments? Maybe from the audience. We don't mind controversy. You know, you like to make some arguments or something, very nice. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for the wonderful class from that. Just a small technical doubt, Maharaj. Uh, it is mentioned that Bhavansura uh, took the earrings of Mother Aditi, uh, but we also know that uh, there were similarly present in Dwaraka as Vasudeva and Devaki also. So were they simultaneously present in the heavenly planets as Aditi and Kashyap and as Vasudev and Devaki Mata in Dwaraka? Yes, that's right. Uh, well, you don't know exactly when he took the earrings. He may have had them for a while, right? You don't know <laughs> exactly how long, what's the time difference there. Okay. Mother Aditi, Kashyapa, 
the residents of the higher planets, Vasudev and Devaki. They're there in Dwarka. We don't know the chronology of all of these different incidents. Srimad Bhagavatam is not chronological. And so it's difficult for us to understand time references for all of this. When it, when it exactly happened, how long he had these hearings. What can we say? But duration of life on the higher planets is going to be much longer. Something which happened up there, in the higher planets, he could have taken them and brought them to Earth, to Vasudev and Devaki. Sorry, it's not, not easy to understand these things in terms of time, how it all takes place. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Uh, I didn't want to ask this, but since you said uh, controversial questions are welcome. <laughs> uh, now, you mentioned in the, the story of Lord Rama when he asks Mother Sita to go away into the forest. And just before that, you were talking about how a woman is first she's protected. I mean, she's in the custody of, of her father, and then later on, to, uh, to, in the custody of her husband. In that instance, Lord Rama was setting up an example of a perfect king. Now, what, okay, that was his dharma also, but then his dharma was also to protect his wife. So, why did one dharma take over, take precedence over the other? Well, you have to consider which dharma is more important, right? Just like we could say about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Now, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took sannyas when he was 24 years old. He had a young wife. I think she was about 16 years old. And he had an elderly mother. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took sannyas and left the home. Maybe he was being irresponsible by doing that. But he had a higher purpose. He had to distribute the holy name. He had to establish the Yuga Dharma. There were many things he had to do. He could not accomplish all of these things just by staying at home. So you have to consider which is the higher dharma. Now is the dharma, Lord Rama had a duty, yes, to his wife, there's some duty there, but then he is also the king. Now which is more important? The ju his duty to one woman, his wife, or his duty to all of the citizens, all the kingdom? His example as a king. As a king, that's generally considered more important. Even in Western countries where they have kings, you know, I think in England one time there was someone, he was the, one of the some person who was supposed to become the ruler, he was supposed to become the king, but he fell in love with a common woman. And then he won, so he married the common woman. He had to give up the throne. They said that you can't be the king because you're marrying some common woman. They wouldn't allow him to be the king. So, okay, he gave up the throne. He didn't become. But Lord Ramachandra's was, duty was to be the king, to rule. Ram Raja, his, his government is famous. Hmm. No one's government's more famous than Lord Rama's government. Hmm. Lee Kuan Yu is famous, not like Lord Rama. Right? His name won't live on for as long as Lord Ramachandra. So yeah, the higher dark.
Any other questions? Garangi, where is Garangi? Ask a question. I know we have many intelligent women here. Hi, Krishna. Maharaj, the ladies here, we were discussing, you know, how um, <laughs> what do you think? Don't say what I said. We were talking about how um, it would have been difficult um, for uh, a woman to have uh, taken shelter in an ashram when she was expecting uh, a child. But I think according to what we've read in the Gita, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have several mothers. Uh, the king's wife is considered one of them. Am I right to say that, Mother? Who? Who's considered one of the mothers? Uh, the, uh, the king's wife. King's wife. Oh, okay. Yeah. When I uh, this was something that I was I had read that I was sharing with Masuji that uh, when Lord Ram heard that uh, Mother Sita is supposed to be uh, in the position of a mother, so he felt that um, she was being shamed. Uh, they were talking ill of uh, their mother, and that was one of the reasons uh, why he felt that uh, she sh should not be spoken of in that manner. And that was one of the reasons why he had sent her away. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, interesting analysis. Huh? You send her away, and then people won't speak ill of her anymore. Huh? Different mothers respecting the mother. So, Mother Sita generally she's known for her for her chastity. That foolish person who criticized Mother Sita, it is said that he came again in Krishna Leela as Kamsa's laundry man. And when Lord Krishna came to Dwarka, came to Mathura, Krishna and Balaram came from Vrindavan to Mathura to fight in the wrestling match. They were they took a walk around Mathura, and at that time they met this Kamsa's laundry man. And so Krishna and Balaram had come out of Vrindavan and you know they're in Vrindavan, it's the countryside, you know, if you live in the countryside then you come to the big city, you know, it's a big difference, you know, you come in your, you know, in, in the countryside you don't get all the name brands, you know, you don't get all the all the nice cloths and then nice colors because you're living in the countryside. So Krishna and Balaram, you know, they had, you know, the minerals from Govardhan Hill. They would <laughs> decorate their faces with the different colored colors from the stones of Govardhan and peacock feathers, you know, things like that for decoration in Vrindavan. But they came to Mathura and they met Kamsa's laundry man and they saw, oh, so many nice cloths. And so they said, oh dear laundry man, why don't you give some of these cloths for us? And the laundry man, you know, because, you know, from his previous life he had this nature to be critical and say bad things about people. And so when Krishna asked him for some cloth, he said, don't be so cheeky. This all belongs to King Kamsa. King Kamsa will have you punished for this. And so Lord Krishna just <laughs> yeah, beheaded him, or he, he ended his life anyway. He liberated him to the Brahman. So this was the result of speaking in inimical about Lord about the Lord, not wanting to do service, just wanting to criticize the Lord. So, Barbara didn't get any good result, really.
Sometimes people say that uh, women in ISKCON, the position of women in ISKCON is not good. They don't have proper opportunity to develop or to nourish or to utilize their talents. But we do see ladies in managerial positions. We have some ladies on the GBC. We have uh, ladies who are in very big positions and doing a lot of very valuable service in the Krishna consciousness movement. So, you have, you have to consider what, what's better. Do you think women in the material world are better off? Women, they go to work, they work in an office with a lot of men. Generally, they work with many men. And mm, how do the men deal with the women often? Is the mood there to give protection or to just exploit? So w women are the weaker sex. Their bodies are generally not as physically strong as a male body and they're given protection. And by keeping them under the care of their father, or their husband, then they're given protection. But of course we see in the Kali Yuga a lot of men are not so responsible. And we see a lot of divorce because women are not taken care of properly. So we encourage Krishna conscious devotees, they should show ideal family life. In 7th Canto Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a chapter there. Maharaj Yudhisthira is talking with Narada Muni. And ideal family life is described. When people live together in Krishna consciousness, then that is actually ideal family life. Okay. Any other question? Otherwise, we'll just finish here. Okay, Prima. Srimad Bhagavatam ki. Jai. Srila Prabhupada ki. Jai. Jai. Hare Krishna. First of all, we would like to thank His